Hello and welcome to another episode of Comicology. I'm your host Jeff Peters and sometimes I actually write this stuff before we go on the air. And speaking of writers, today we get to talk to Denny O'Neill, who was a writer and editor for Marvel and DC through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and was the group editor on Batman until his retirement. Our very own Anna Cody caught up with Denny O'Neill at the Hawthorne High School Comic Convention. Let's hear about Denny's life and career in comics. Hello, Denny. How are you? Hi, Anna. <laughs> so how, what got you interested in the business? What brought you into this line of work? Pure accident. Uh, <laughs> I was a, a reporter in a, a small daily in southeast Missouri in a town called Cape Girardeau. And one of my duties was to fill the children's page on Saturday. Well, every, I, I shared it with another reporter. Wasn't any school activities to write about during the summer, but I noticed that I was seeing comic books. And then I realized I hadn't been seeing them. I was a huge comics reader when I was a kid, yeah. and then school and other things, you, I lost track of them. Suddenly there they were again, in the drugstores and the bus stations. So I picked up some and I read them, I really enjoyed them. And I what had, were your favorite reads at the time? I don't even remember. I just <laughs> did that thing that you do when you find a new enthusiasm of buying everything. I guess more Marvels than, than DCs back then. So I wrote a couple of articles for the children's page about the return of comics. I was right. They were making a return after being in Eclipse for about a decade. It so happened that Roy Thomas's parents subscribed to the paper. Roy was probably one of the two or three best-known comic fans in the country at the time. Did Alter Ego. He's still doing it. It's a great fancy. And uh, Roy got in touch with me. It, he was about to leave his job as a teacher at Fox High School and go to New York and work in professional comics. So I did. I spent an afternoon with Roy, absolutely fascinated by this whole world I didn't know existed. And I did an article. I'm sure you've read a hundred articles like it. Local boy makes good, does something unusual. <laughs> and off went Roy. Went to New York. About a month later, I was back in the newspaper office. Everybody was gone home. I had covered a suicide. I was not feeling great about uh, small town journalism. I didn't, didn't actually see the guy who killed himself, but the phone rang and it was Roy wanting to know if he could send me the Marvel writers test. It seemed that Stan Lee was, he, in the month that he'd been gone, he had stopped working for DC and accepted a job with Marvel, which was exploding. Stan needed another assistant. So he sent me the, the writer's test and this was four fantastic four pages without copy. And my mission, should I choose to do it, would be to add words to the picture. They were Jack Kirby pictures. So in the spirit of why the hell not, uh, what else am I doing? I did it and then I got a call offering me a job. Well. You're a small town guy, you're just out of the Navy a year, and somebody offers you a chance to go to New York and work in comics. How are you not gonna do that? <laughs> well, that's true. So I- Do you know what you wrote? Yeah, well, I, I went thinking, I'll give this a year, I'll, I'll have the experience of living in New York, I'll get some stories to tell, and then I'll go back to the real world. That was 40 years ago. Uh, never quite got back to that newspaper job, but uh, I think the first writing I did was on Millie the Model. Millie the Model? And, yes. And Patsy and Hetty, Girls on the Go-Go, these two <laughs> career girl types. This was a guy who was a hippie who probably, well, I didn't own a suit when I went to work for Stan. He made me buy one. So I was writing about a fashion model and career girls. <laughs> bad casting but it was a great way to learn there was nothing very much at stake right, right. it just learn the basics of the crap where do you put the balloons on the page how many words do you you put in each panel that kind of real basic stuff and it would have been very hard to fail at that I mean it, 
so I did that, and then they, they let me do Doc Strange for a year, my first real superhero, and I did a Daredevil story, and I did a lot of Westerns. Again, for somebody who grew up on Roy Rogers and Hopalong Casty, it was great to ride into town at it was sunset. The your yeah. Too. yeah. And it was another way, since they were not the high profile superhero titles, it was a way to learn plotting and, you know, the ABCs of comic book writing. Right. So I worked for Stan for a while, and then I went freelance. I did more journalism, did, edited a news magazine for a while, kept up doing comics, and uh, heard that there was this guy, Dick Giordano, who was looking at writers. He worked for a company I didn't know about called Charlton, and he was in Manhattan one day a week. Charlton was in Derby, Connecticut. I went to see Dick, and under a pseudonym, I wrote for him for a year as Sergius O'Shaughnessy, which was the name of the hero of Norman Mailer's novel, The Deer Park, which I loved. <laughs> wow. And, um, Why under a pseudonym? Because I was doing very respectable magazine journalism, and I was also working for Stan, and I didn't know how Marvel would feel about me working for the competition or about how my magazine clients right. would feel about a guy doing serious reportage doing comic books. I mean, comic books, remember, were not reputable at the no. time. So uh, after a year of working for Charlton, Dick got hired by DC and brought five of his Charlton people with him, uh, myself among them. And uh, I started wandering around DC. I did Bomba the Jungle Boy. I think that was my first DC assignment. And a few months into it, Dick took me down the hall and introduced me to this guy named Julie Schwartz. Well, I, as I said, I was a hippie. I was uh, also involved in the peace movement. Long hair, long, uh, hard to believe now, but long, <laughs> unkempt hair and jeans. And that was at a time when people wore suits and ties, or at least jackets and ties, to comic book offices. So he was seeing this unkempt hippie, and I was seeing a guy in a white shirt and tie sitting behind a desk. Well, I had been through Catholic schools, Jesu a Jesuit college, <laughs> the United Navy. States Navy. If there's <laughs> one thing life had taught me, it was I wasn't going to get along with any authority figure. <laughs> so uh, we approached each other cautiously, and he tried me out on a story, and he li it was a Green Lantern story. Oh, Green Lantern. Mm -hmm. And he liked what I did, and that began probably the most fruitful relation, professional relationship I've ever had. Yes. We very shortly came to respect each other, and then uh, the last ten years of his life, we became friends. It was a very. When did you, um, you worked on Batman? Yeah, I started that in about. 68, when Julie first offered it to me, that was during Batman's camp era, and I passed no judgment on camp. I just, I think, kind of figured I couldn't do it, or I couldn't do it well. Why? It was a, a, a kind of a sense of humor that I didn't share. Uh, when he offered it to me a year later, it was after the TV show had folded. The camp was as dead as button hooks by then. <laughs> I mean, it was one of those fads that when it went away, it yes, went away it in really a hurry. Did. Yeah. And uh, Neil Adams and I were the new kids on the block. We were the flavor of the week. And so uh, what Julie said was, in effect, reinvent Batman. Wow. Well, that we felt we were up to. Wow. And uh, for years on stages and in interviews, I told people that what Neil and I did was simply take the character back to his roots. Wow. And do that with this, with what people had learned about telling comic book stories in the in, uh, 30 years right. since 1939. Right. And then I went back and read those stories and realized that what we did was implicit, the obsessed loner. But it wasn't right. very much on stage. And 11 months after the first Batman story was published, they introduced Robin. At which point. Ro Batman became kind of a vuncular or even a father figure. Yes. Might not be a father you'd ever want to <laughs> have as your father, but that's what he was. Yeah. And then it was all kind of confused. By 1945, he was carrying a platinum police badge. He was obviously a cop. I don't think anybody knew exactly what he was. In the 50s, he was, well, the 50s were the Eisenhower era. 
Yes. He was Gotham's leading citizen. He would walk down the sunlit streets of Gotham waving to his fans. They would have <laughs> spend the day with Batman contests. And then he became a comedian in the 60s with the camp thing, which was a one-line joke. And the joke is, I loved this stuff when I was six. Now that I'm in my 30s and I have a drinking problem, a bi-weekly appointment with a shrink, a divorce behind me, and a closet full of fancy clothes, look how silly it is to me now. Yes. It is yes. a one-line joke. Right. And then at the, in 1968, along came Neil and I, and as I said, we, well, what we did was really implicit in what Bill Finger and Bob Kane did, but as I the said... The lines, what did you do? Like, when you say you brought him back to his roots. We took Batman and made him a loner, yes. made him obsessed. Yes. About that time, I read an essay by the great uh, science fiction writer Alfred Bester about writing obsessed characters. His greatest novel is Stars My Destination, which is about a really deeply obsessed character. And I showed that to Julie, and he agreed that would be a good take on Batman. So we, we eliminated for a while all humor. Led, later we let humor creep back in, but it was humor that wasn't making fun of the characters. We allowed people to say funny things as people do in real life. And we sort of figured out, well, what would he have to be? He'd have to be a detective. He'd have to be an athlete. If this guy could exist in real life, what would he be? Neil once told me that if Batman existed, he would have to be as I drew him. So Batman, I mean, Neil came from almost from an illustrator's rather than a cartoonist standpoint. Uh, there's a term that um, literary people use called magic realism. Uh, I just finished reading A Hundred Years of Solitude, which is uh, the seminal uh, magic realist novel. And it's our world but tweaked and yes. heightened. Yeah. It's our world modified so that things can happen in it. Mm. Uh, the, the Broadway show and HBO uh, show Angels in America is about yes. very real problems, but every once in a while an angel comes down. Yes. And I realize that's what we've been doing with Batman all these years. Yes. It is recognizably our world, but there can be a Batmobile, and there can be yes. a guy like Batman, and there can be a Joker. Yes. Our world sort of seen in a funhouse mirror. Yes. And I think that's what Neil and I brought to the table. Uh, characters have to be allowed to evolve. That's what I learned as an editor. Yes. If we were doing the Batman that I did, I read when I was six, man, and I loved it. I don't know why I like Batman, but I did. And we'd have about 50 intensely loyal readers. They'd all be my age, and we would meet in a, in a phone booth for our convention. Uh, the characters, Batman, Superman, are still popular after 65 plus years because they have been allowed to evolve or in some cases caused to evolve. But mostly it happens unconsciously. Uh, as an editor, the most interesting part of a very interesting job was to know when to let that happen. And occasionally we nudged along a little bit. And you're always guessing, nobody has ever done that work before. Nobody has ever edited a character that has been in continuous publication for 65 years in all media, in the whole history of narrative from Gilgamesh forward. So it, it was a fascinating job because we were always making it up as we went along to some degree and learning from our mistakes. And you became group editor, Bradley. Yeah. How was that different for you than being a writer? Would you like it more? What were the pluses and minuses of that? very different discipline because I realized after a couple of false starts that my job as editor is not to be a creator but to help those guys do their work. It's like being a teacher, it's a helping profession. And I was always happiest when I could write edited in red pen on a script and send it through untouched. It didn't happen often but it did happen. Everybody misspells. If I felt something needed rewriting, that happened once in a while, uh, I would go to the writer and say, here's a problem I have with your story. Your options are these. You can, you can convince me I'm wrong. I might, I'm not infallible. You can rewrite it yourself or I will give you, I will rewrite it. I will give you a solution. I would much prefer you to come up with your own answer. 
and yeah. always, if it was just a line or two, I worked with real pros. They say, Don't, yeah. what are you bothering me for? <laughs> if you want to rewrite a line, rewrite a line. If it was a substantial rewrite, then almost always they would come up with a better answer to the problem. My job was to point out the problem right. and show that a solution was possible. They always came up with a better idea. That's incredible. Now, Jason Todd, is it true that he died during your tenure as professor? Yeah, that was the so-called phone That's stunt. That's a big event. Oh, was it ever. Huh? It changed my mind about what I do for a living. How so? Uh, well, we were, Jeanette Kahn and I and a couple of other people were literally just sitting around after an editorial retreat one day. Uh, and I came up with the idea for what we call this telephone stunt. Jason Todd had become a problem. You've heard of characters taking on a life of their own. Well, it, it sometimes actually happens. One of the writers sort of liked making Jason Todd a snot for very valid reasons. Uh, dramatic contrast. Um, but Jason Todd had kind of become a little bit too bratty. And we knew we were going to have to do something about him, change his personality, write him out of the series, do something. So I thought of this telephone stunt. What happened was we put Jason Todd in an explosion, engineered by the Joker. The readers had three days. They called 1-800 number, he survived the explosion. In the advertising, I wasn't allowed to use the word kill or die. <laughs> But it went one way with one 800 number and another way with another. And Dick Giordano, who was my boss at the time, thought they're going to let him live. And I thought they will see if we have nerve enough to kill him. Uh, he, 65 votes, I think, made the difference. Thumbs down. Mary and I were in my office at 7 o'clock. I called the phone company at 10 after 7. They gave me the final count. We had the alternate ending in the drawer, we put it into the works, and uh, then came the storm. Even being shielded, I spent about three days on the phone giving interviews to radio stations and whatsoever. I was buying a tuna salad sandwich at a deli on Fifth Avenue and I had a Batman pin on. The guy said, you know, what's that? And I said, I'm the Batman editor. He said, hey, this is the guy that killed Robin! <laughs> I was so glad that I had not done any television appearances. Uh, I didn't People want this face to like. be associated with that event. And I thought, well, don't they realize this is a made-up kid? I didn't kill a kid. It's paper and ink and imagination. And then I realized I'm not just a writer and editor working in a given medium. These characters have been around so long. They are our postmodern folklore. Everybody, 80% of the people on the planet know Superman and Batman and Robin. So a lot of people didn't realize it was Jason Todd. They thought it was Dick Grayson who had meanwhile graduated to being Nightwing and became his own superhero. It was just they knew that Robin had died. And, uh, and they were in mourning. Yeah, and it was, it was a, an incredible. Uh, amount of publicity for what I thought was you know, kind of interesting stuff. And we, uh, a lot of it was angry. My vote I cast for saving him because halfway into this I realized if he dies, I've got an editorial problem because probably the world will want a Robin to go as Batman. Anyway, he died and uh, I think the two guys most responsible for recreating the character did a wonderful job. The new Robin would be, if he wasn't associated with Batman, he would be a terrific character. That was Marv Wolfman and Chuck Dixon. With very little help from me, they took it and they ran with it and they gave us, I think, a new and improved kid sidekick. They thought it out. What would this kid have to be? Let's make him a nice kid and give that as a given. And then let's, let's make him an age where it's like, I mean, the original problem with the original Batman was you got this eight-year-old kid what are we going to do with him? Send him in up against the most vicious maniacs in town <laughs> three times a week. And that was okay in the 40s, but right. people have gotten more serious about things. Uh, so we, we made him a, a teenager. We gave him a costume that has all kinds of safety stuff built in. And we didn't let him actually fight any bad guys for the first year. Batman would say, 
you keep watch, you be on the rooftop across. <laughs> and eventually we contrived a storyline where, or they, Chuck, I guess it was, contrived a storyline where he had to fight. Because it is, it's not real life, it is magic realism. And it's an action medium, it's, a, it's action melodrama. Um, right here we have uh, the book of Rachel Ghoul, which is the character that Denny created. Do you want to talk a little bit about him? Yeah, sure. Julie and I decided that it was time for a new major villain. He had a name. Big villains for Batman. Yeah, yeah. right. Major. Uh, a, a, a hero, a melodramatic hero, is only as good as the, his his antagonist. We needed somebody big for Batman to fight, and there hadn't been a new one for a while. Julie had a name, Rachel Ghoul, which means head of the demon. So I went home and wrote a story in which. Robin is kidnapped, and it turns out to be a ploy to get Ro to, to test Batman. There are clues scattered throughout the story, and at the end, it turns out that Raish is looking for a mate for his daughter. He needs a son. Uh, Raish has many good qualities, but he like he doesn't die, right? Yeah, he's been around since the 14th century, and he is a male chauvinist big kind of guy. <laughs> So although Talia is beautiful and smart mm. and tough, mm. he's got to have a son. Right. Uh, and this character shows up in the new movie, the new Batman Yeah, movie, right? he, is, he is the main villain. There's also the Scarecrow makes an appearance in the mo new movie. But right. yeah, this guy is, is the villain. And you adapted the screenplay for the new movie? I wrote the novel, yeah. Wrote the novel. That's so what's next for you? What's in the works? Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of retired, and I teach a lot. You teach? What do you teach? I teach comics writing. Oh. So it's it's a pleasant way to live. I am just as busy as I want to be. Yes. My son and a few of my ex-assistants are urging me to do something autobiographical. Oh, wow. And what I can say is I lived through a time when comics went from being the disreputable uh, literature for the illiterate. You, mm -hmm. Two, my God, I gave a lecture at MIT. We're as respectable as it's possible. Yes. The New York Times yes. is full of comic book stories now, and there yes. was a time when I don't think they would touch them. Yes. So like jazz, like film noir, yep. the world has awakened and realized this has been an art form from the get-go, mm -hmm. and occasionally it has been a brilliant art form. Yes. Uh, my friend Will Eisner, who died just about two months ago, has for 30 years been doing brilliant novels about Jewish life in the, uh, in the 30s, where he grew up in Brooklyn. He started doing a kind of superhero comic, The, the Spirit. He did that until 1952. Uh, for the last five years or so, his helper was Jules Pfeiffer. Then he quit, he went off and did other things and became reasonably well-to-do. When he didn't need to worry about writing for markets anymore, he came back and kind of invented the graphic novel. And I, uh, there was, DC Comics recently published something called the Will Eisner Companion, which is about his work. I got to write the introduction to that, and it's just absolutely incredible stuff. Uh, he's writing in such an expressive way, nobody in any other medium has been able to do what he's done with this strange combination of art and copy. Uh, so I have had a ringside seat. You really to, have to watch an art form evolve. You really have. And then, being the Batman editor, hey, we've been all around the world. We've had. Uh, Lunch in the Senate dining room because the senator really? is a Batman fan. Wow. Pat Leahy, who is a senator from oh, Vermont, I think Pat wouldn't mind my saying that because he wrote the intro to one of our Batman collections. No, clearly not. I've gotten to do maybe some good in the world. We did a comic book, a Batman comic called Seduction of the Gun. And what had happened was a colleague's son was murdered in Greenwich Village in one of those absolutely senseless killings. Guy's phone didn't work. He went down to the corner to use a payphone. Somebody shot him to death. 
that's a long time ago. The crime has not been solved. It won't be solved. Right. Our, our president, the publisher at the time, was Jeanette Kahn, and she said, we have to do something about this. So John Ostrander wrote a story called Seduction of the Gun, which I edited. About that time, Douglas Wilder, who was the governor of Virginia, was trying to get an anti-gun law passed. And what one of his assistants later told me is that the pro-gun forces didn't mount much of an effort against him because uh, nobody was going to get an anti-gun law published in Virginia. John's story came out, and usually Gotham City is not New York. But in this case, it was clearly a stand-in for New York. And one of the facts that John incorporated was that people could drive from New York to Virginia and with nothing more than a driver's license, load up the trunk of their car with automatic pistols. Eight hours later, those, one of those guns would be pointed at a deli owner in Brooklyn. Yeah. So that story came out and people were saying, even Batman knows that you go to Virginia for guns. Right. So <laughs> Wilder's Law got passed. Really? And John and his wife Kim and my wife Mary Fran and I were invited to uh, watch it be signed into law. I got to throw a wet raincoat on the, the governor's sofa in his, his living room. Wow. And we saw the, uh, the law passed. It's, uh, in another instance, Jeanette Kahn asked me to come to a certain conference room and I walked in and I saw a famous folk singer and a lot of guys were obviously heavyweight guys. Yeah. It was, for the next hour and a half I listened to people talk about landmines. I was not aware that landmines were a problem. I walked out of there knowing they are a problem for many countries, not this one. And furthermore, they are targeted at children. They look, they're little plastic things about the size of a shoe polish can and the bright colored a lot of them. That's deliberate. What the warlords want is for a kid to pick one up and be maimed, yeah. not die. Be maimed so he's a walking reminder that you don't mess with me. Yeah. Uh, so we did two things. We did a super, or the Superman guys did a Superman book, which was a how-to. Hey kids, this is what a landmine looks like. This is what you do if you see one. And that was translated into the appropriate languages and distributed, I think, free of cost. Wow. What we did was, our, our job was to raise consciousness in this country. So we did a Batman story in which Batman goes over to one of those countries mm -hmm. and does not succeed in saving the life of a little girl whose father has been killed by a landmine. So the guy who is the head of the anti-landmine effort here in this country said it was the most effective propaganda he'd ever had, and I can't tell you how gratifying that was. I mean, maybe we get to save lives once in a while. Mostly we're in the business of entertaining people, and that's yes. a fine thing to do. Yes. That's a really noble calling. But once in a while we get to do a little more. Denny O'Neill, thank you so mm. much. My pleasure. <sighs> Jeff, back to you in the studio. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you, Denny, for a wonderful interview. Well, that's about all the time we have for this show. Man, these things are flying by. I, I don't even get to do much anymore, which I'm sure is a great relief to those of you watching at home. Until next time, see you in the funny papers. <laughs> <laughs>